Hello, my name is Daniel Benvenisti, and the videotape you're about to see is part of a larger research project on the origins of psychoanalysis in San Francisco. The story of the origins of psychoanalysis in San Francisco is a rich and colorful one and tells us as much about the San Francisco psychoanalytic community's past as it does about our present. One of Freud's first pupils in 1897 was the young Dr. Felix Gattel, who is said to have been born in San Francisco in 1870. In 1920, the famous anthropologist, Dr. Alfred Krober, who had been analyzed on the East Coast, opened the first psychoanalytic practice in San Francisco. This was the same year that he wrote his well-known anthropological critique on Freud's Totem and Taboo. He practiced analysis part-time for two years and then rededicated himself to his anthropological work. In 1930, Dr. Joe Thompson, an American also trained on the East Coast, came to San Francisco and opened up a full-time analytic practice. In 1932, he began training a lay analyst, Mr. Aaron Morofka, who subsequently practiced psychoanalysis in San Francisco for the next 55 years. In the mid-1930s, the emigres from Europe began to arrive in San Francisco. Dr. Bernhard Berliner and his wife Hildegard Berliner arrived in 1936. In 1937, Dr. Siegfried Bernfeld and his wife Suzanne Bernfeld arrived in San Francisco. During the next few years, the San Francisco Bay Area was blessed with the arrival of Anya Menchen, Emanuel Windholtz, Eric Erickson, Joan Erickson, Elsa Frankel Brunswick, and Egon Brunswick. It was also during this time that the American-born analyst Nevitt Sanford came and settled in the Bay Area. Of all these analysts, Dr. Siegfried Bernfeld was the one who studied the longest and was the most closely affiliated with Sigmund Freud himself. And his wife, Suzanne Bernfeld, was the only San Francisco analyst to be analyzed by Sigmund Freud. In my Origins of Psychoanalysis in San Francisco Research Project, I have gathered oral histories from some of Bernfeld's San Francisco students, most notably Dr. Nathan Adler. In the videotaped oral history you are about to see, we will have the opportunity to see and hear the reminiscences of the internationally known psychoanalyst, Dr. Rudolf Eckstein. While Dr. Eckstein is not a San Francisco analyst, he was a student of Bernfeld's when they were both still in Vienna. And he was also associated with some of San Francisco's other early psychoanalytic pioneers. As such, his oral history represents an important link in the chain of continuity from psychoanalysis in Freud's Vienna to today's psychoanalytic community here in San Francisco. I hope you enjoy the videotape. Okay. Now, you already told me a little bit, but uh, I was wondering if you could begin by just telling me how you first got interested in psychoanalysis. It's a long, long time ago. There is this nice district in Vienna where I grew up. It's a strange district. The people that live there in one part, the lower middle class, in another part, workers, certainly not rich people. But this district had a special meaning for me because when you walked in this district, you came by as it's most likely true for other districts as well, but not as much as for this district 
can't buy points of culture in this town, such as when I would leave my house, I would walk up one street and go there on Rostoffer Straße. In two minutes, I'm at the birthplace of Schubert, Franz Schubert. If I go the other way down to a church, there is a Catholic church there, and there is also a monument because Schubert played there and created his music there. If one walk a little farther, you would come to a building where Tantra began, a professor of anatomy, famous professor of anatomy, who later had, like all of us, to escape. He escaped to China. I don't know whether he ever came back. I don't remember at the moment. But two minutes, if I went another way from my house, there was a place that was called Kinderübernahmestelle, a place for children where they would be taken over when they are in trouble. And one of the professors, Charlotte Bühler, of the university, together with other assistants, and together with Tandler, who had created this place, tried to be interested in children. When you went to the university, of course, some 10, 12 minutes from where I lived, there were professors like Schick, the philosopher of the Viennese School of Philosophy, Carnap worked there, Gompertz worked there, Max Adler worked there, who happened to be a philosopher, a Kantian and a Marxist. He was surrounded with an intellectual environment that is hard to believe. But if he didn't go to the university and stop uh, at, at one place where there are two streets, if he went to the right, there was Alfred Adler teaching. If he went to the left, he went down Bergkasse, and there was Sigmund Freud teaching. So at first I went to Adler because some people recommended I should, it's interesting. And after a while it was less interesting to me and I learned from others, but there is also Freud. And I walked down the street and I heard for the first time as I told you, Eichhorn, August Eichhorn, that is uh, the, the man who wrote way about youth and worked with delinquent children, with poor children. And there was Anna Freud who had developed in 1937 or so, excuse me, 27 child analysis. And I came now there around 35 and had found my way. Most likely it's for any student here too, that if you remember your university days, that you have certain people whom you select as mentors, they cannot select you. The kind of teachers that I selected were my selection, right or wrong, and of course, later on, I realized they were the way to go. I went this way. So that I was at that time, when I came to Berkasse, uh, Berkasse 19 at first, although the, the institute itself was also at Berkasse, but a little nearer to Beringerstraße that I mentioned, I had found a place, and that was as early as 35, I was then a 22-year-old boy. Because in Vienna, you could develop interest in psychoanalysis without already having to have a doctor's degree. It was expected you would do that anyway. It was possible for lay people to be accepted. After all, Anna Freud was a quote, lay person, unquote, because she didn't have a medical degree. And what time it took her to be finally accepted in America because if she would have been a refugee and come to America, I do not believe that at the time that we all came, around 1938, she would have become a member. And mm -hmm. she didn't come to America. As a matter of fact, decided to never really fully come to America, except that she took some of her doubts, which were also her father's doubts, about America back, and came and visited us several times, you can find in the other room mm -hmm. pictures that we were taken, were, were taken when she was teaching here in Los Angeles. But to come back, my decision then was that I must go two ways. I wanted to be a psychologist, and even though the Bühlers, Karl and Charlotte Bühler, were highly interesting and interesting people in the field, for me it was not enough because I 
did not just want to be a theoretician, I didn't just want to be a scientist, I wanted to be someone who helps people, who educates people, I wanted at first to become a teacher, and in that sense I found the Adlerians at first and then the Freudians, and I wanted to be a teacher because I felt we can change the world if the young people are different. In the old world, it seemed we needed world wars. We, however, can have a peaceful, democratic society, but democracy begins at home, begins with the parents. I became now a teacher interested in parents, interested in children, interested in children that could not learn. As a matter of fact, beginning 14 years old, having an Adlerian high school professor at the time, high school professor, I began to tutor children and learn by understanding them and I was much nearer them than the professors mm -hmm. and I had begun to be interested in psychology to help them. Just today I had a letter from a man who must be now in his early 70s to tell me that he had just changed his address. I tutored him when he was a little boy, he became an engineer. He had a successful life and the relationship still exists, as is true for many others. But that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. I would say the beginning came out of a social desire to help to make a better world. It should not be the, wor the, the world of the post ter terrible post-war years in Vienna, where we all went hungry, where there was unemployment and where there slowly came fascism. So the interests were in part a wish to help people, in part to change the whole world, I became political. And as I became political, I understand we can only change the world if the people that are supposed to help you change the world are willing to change the world. What kind of people would be willing to change the world? Only people who understand themselves, who have ambitions and will not be the victims of movements such as drive-by shooting here in America, or of drugs, or of alcohol, even though there was plenty of all these kinds in Vienna, as is true in every big city. And then, I was once a tutor in a summer home, and some people had an interesting book that they wanted me to read. I wanted to be an educator. Sisyphus, or the Boundaries of Education, von Siegfried Bernfeld a man who ended the you know, in San Francisco. I read the book and I realized it was so much up my alley because it had a combination of psychological thinking and sociological thinking. And I asked my friends in that home which was outside of Vienna, somewhere in the mountains, where can we learn these things? Don't you know, in Vienna there is a movement under the leadership of Anna Freud, of, of August Eichhorn, which trains psychoanalytically oriented pedagogues. Some high school teachers will go there, many elementary school people go there, kindergarten teachers go there, and I went there, I was accepted, born Willy Hofer, and I had found a new world. Then came one of the other. What year was this? 35. And in 35, <coughs> the road changed. As I said, for me it was between 22 and 23, and there I was. But in 35, there was already a fascist government, and it would be impossible to ever get the professorship for, for a socialist who was Jewish as well, to get a professorship at one of the high schools. But I will do anyway, and I passed all the examinations, and I changed slowly to pure philosophy, and suddenly learned that there were three places where I have to go in order to learn. I have to go to the university, not only the PhD, but also because there are the kind of teachers I want for my kind of philosophy. I have to go to Bergkasse, five minutes from the university, because there is psychoanalysis, not at the university. And I went a few blocks away to another place where socialist students at their headquarters. And between these three points, change the world. 
learn philosophy, learn psychology, was the life of this young man. Uh, not unlike the story that so often comes to mind, that in the ninth district that I mentioned where I grew up, there was one man who said, Victor Adler, that is, who founded in the last century the Social Democratic Party, who said we must change the city. And there was another man, Adler, we must change the school system, we must help the children. And there was a third man, Freud, who says you must change your mind and your soul and understand yourself. And there was a fourth man, Herzl, you see him over there next to Freud, mm -hmm. Theodor Herzl, who said, you won't do, you won't do. You must change the land and go elsewhere. Change the land, change the city, change yourself. I tried all three of them. That's why you and I sit here. Even though the world in Vienna has changed, I go back and forth. I am there as somebody who is honored and can teach there and can live there and come back to the States that gave me freedom after the invasion of Austria. And uh, I realized analytical training and one's own analysis are the key points in order to be able to bring this apart. So I'm sitting here and as you look at this room, you ask yourself, is this America? It is America, because every American if you really understands this country returns also to his past. He has the past and the present. He goes with the philosopher, isn't it, the American philosopher who says, those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat it. We want to remember the past and live in the present and work on the change of the future. It is what you have inherited, you keep, but you make it useful for other people. So it is not private property alone. Books that should be read by others and not be just my private interest. And others are it is books. And then you slowly discover you want to contribute yourself and you have teachers who taught you how to think. You can do it. I think on the of my last conversation with Bruno Bethlehem, which took place just here on, on, on this sofa, he's sitting here, I'm sitting on the other side, and we spoke about our teachers who helped us to become different and to become contributors, and truly become contributors. That's how I came here, and therefore it's an American room. It's sad to think it was at that time only possible in America to achieve that, because America is the land, we say, of unlimited possibilities. Fortunately, in my case, good possibilities, and where you are allowed to bring the past that you don't have to be ashamed of your past. Mm -hmm. There may be Americans who have difficulties to accept new people that come from other countries and say, enough, we don't want them. But there are also Americans who understand and remember that even though they themselves uh, were born here, that their parents or their grandparents came from somewhere. It's a land of unlimited opportunities and we want to keep that open. And I think of psychoanalysis as an opportunity, one's own analysis, of unlimited opportunities, namely that one finds new options, one makes new things with one's life, one is never gets stuck. Psychoanalysis does not serve the purpose to take away a headache or take away a symptom, it goes much deeper. It helps the person to discover the repressed values in himself and to become another person. When I came here, I still I had two suitcases. If I had to escape again, I'd need a lot of more suitcases. <laughs> Freud at the time needed more suitcases for the books that he had collected, and they're all in Hampstead. Now, when when you went to uh, Vergasa 19 to hear, uh, uh, was Bernfeld was at that there? time? 
Ben felt in the beginning was still there, but he was most of the time out of town, and my re recollection of him, I told you, people told me, read Sisyphus. I came to Hofer, who was one of my ideal teachers there, Willy Hofer. Of course, he was the very best friend of Bernfeld, because Bernfeld and Willy Hofer, after the First World War, had created a home for Weber youth. Unlike Icon, they had a different home, where they mainly had to deal with refugee children after the First World War, Polish Jewish children and other children who came there. Book had been a famous book had been written about, and um, these were the teachers. And it's important to remember that the teachers of analysis at that time were socially involved. They didn't just have a private practice to make money or to cure a few people. They were socially involved. They were engaged in research, and all of them are known in the literature. Why we have today endless people for whom the praxis is enough. And I would like to hope that people like me could, so to speak, push a little few, a few little people, a few people into new opportunities mm -hmm. and to see more than a quick practice mm -hmm. or to work, to work in a hospital and be only a practitioner. I don't mind our practitioners, but I like that those who can go beyond that have an opportunity to do so. That's why I would like to have cycling institutes who go beyond training practitioners. That was always true in Vienna. That when one looks at the membership list of the Viennese Cycling Society at the time when all fell apart, I think there were about, about 70, a small group. You go through name after name and find out what they contributed can find it just in this room. Unbelievable. You take 70 members of the society from this town or another town or whatever the town is and ask yourself, where's the work? Interesting statistical task to put to. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship between creative contributions of the graduates of the society and the number that graduate from that group? Of course, I realize in medicine it's the same. You know, how many medical doctors, after they go into practice, are ever known for a single line? Mm -hmm. Except maybe a drug advertisement. So now, when you were when you were studying there, you say I guess Bernfeld must have been in uh, in Berlin part time, or maybe full time yes. visiting. in I, I was just coming to it. He came to Vienna. And I met him in an interesting situation. Namely, he came to the counterpart of my upbringing. I'm speaking about the philosophy professor Schlick. Mm -hmm. They sat together in the seminar and were discussing uh, the notion of Bernfeld and Feitelberg that one can measure libido. Mm -hmm. And they developed a whole scheme of measuring libido. But they were up against Schwickian thinking. And I remember the inner struggle. Am I to believe in him, for whom analysis is important, and Marxism, and socialist thinking? Or am I to believe in him, who says, I will teach you how to have thoughts of your own and how to think? When I wrote the thesis and sent it to Schlick. He told me, when I, mean, I called him up to find out was he good enough, he said, you gave an excellent account of my thoughts. If you want to be a doctor of philosophy, you must have thoughts of your own. At first, anger that he didn't accept it. Number two, I get depressed, I will never amount to anything. I must hurry to get a doctor's degree, I will never get it. And suddenly, one night, the thought comes to my mind, I can have thoughts of my own. I thought if you want to be a doctor of philosophy, you have to chew over the thoughts of your professor. And 
prove to him that you're a of Most professors were that way, not him. And I inherited from him that I am entitled to have thoughts of my own, so that even if I am, if I would be a direct descendant of Sigmund Freud, I can have thoughts of my own, and thoughts also too. He did not expect that people should be imitators of Freud. In that sense, there are no Freudians. For whom? For him, people would be Freudians who have started with him and have developed psychonic thinking and contributed something. I know phrases after phrases and, and chapters, I mean paragraphs after paragraphs, where Freud in his own biography spoke about his wish that he does not have just people who adore him, who are followers, but who have learned from him to think analytically and develop their own language, their own concept. And so it went. And while many people experienced it differently, and very often experiencing their own analysts in the similar way, you must imitate me. If it's analyzed well, one does not end up and imitate you. And in Schlick, and in Freud later, or in Anna Freud, I had people who allowed me to go my own way. And that's why in many ways I remained very near them. Was, uh, was Sigmund Freud in uh, the seminars that you He was at that time not teaching anymore, so that you would be in seminar. There were a few older people, you know, that were in a small group that still met. I don't know whether they still met 35, it may be, but it ended then Freud's health did not permit it, and he did not do official teaching. He did not give the introductory lectures, of course, but we gave, we, we, we used now what was written. Mm -hmm. Did you see him around? You would see Freud. I happen to have a friend who lived exactly opposite Berggasse 19, on Berggasse 20, 20, 20, 20. And we would sometimes see him at the window. And uh, often I think of that fascinating story how I would walk with a friend of mine up and down Berggasse. Now, he was the Minister of Justice who was arrested together with me in Berggasse 20 because we had a secret meeting there and the police got after us. And he would say to me, do you remember? You and I were in Berggasse 20 we ended up in jail. You had it good because it was the first time, so they let you go after a couple of weeks. But for me it was concentration camp, and then escape and coming to America. Now we are both back, and now we move from Berggasse 20 to Berggasse 19. And we are going up there because a book of yours, your last book, will be celebrated. That was the purpose of the meeting. Berkasse 20, police, persecution, escape. Berkasse 19, as we crossed the street, I've become Minister of Justice, and you've become a famous internationally known psychoanalyst. And we both sort of looked at each other. Is it really true? It was like a dream come true. It began as a nightmare. So when you have ever nightmares, remember sometimes you can move from one side of the street to the other side of the street. <laughs> That's what about. But he then not, did not teach officially anymore, but we sat with his next people who were next to him in endless seminars, and he became alive for us. Mm -hmm. and he, but he wouldn't come to the seminar. He would not the come to these seminars, you know, that I was entitled to. I'm speaking about the time between 35 and 38. In 38 uh, was the invasion, and, 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 and a few weeks later he left and was saved, and a few weeks later I escaped and came at first to England. And in England I saw, of course, Anna Freud, but not Freud. He was by that time a dying man. In 39 he died after many
painful surgeries. Now, uh, for the cancer of his mouth. Uh -huh. Could you describe to me the uh, the vision of looking across the street and seeing Freud in his in his home? What's, what's well, it was a strange world because the two of us also studied philosophy mm -hmm. and prepared ourselves for the for the strenuous rigorous of the last examination. Mm -hmm. And we talked about philosophy and the interesting thing about this man, this friend of man, was he's still alive somewhere here in the States and I met him once again. He was interested in psychology used for advertising, how to sell something to people. But I was interested in the kind of psychology that helps people to change, not to sell them, but to help them understand themselves. So that for him, Freud was not the way that he would go, so that he knew of his importance. And of course he had read like I did and did know but it was like two friends who have a different and completely different vision. I envied him for that window, you know. Yeah. Well, he looked really elsewhere, you know. So he'd say, yes, I saw him sometimes. Or you could see him walk out the house or whatever, isn't it? And uh, what is so fascinating that two men sit at a window near that kind of source. The one does nothing with it, or something completely different, and the other one does. And what it teaches you is that you sometimes think that the same encounter can have similar results in two people. But it is what you do with the encounter. And so one person can be fraught, does differently. You know, such as. Uh, what did, I don't know, what Stefan Zweig do with Freud? Or what did some of the biographers of Freud do with him? Mm -hmm. Or what did my friend uh, do with Freud at that time? And what did I do? And uh, i just tell you a little anecdote. After I had escaped successfully, my father was still in Vienna. And our family doctor met him on the street, also a Jew. And he said, how is Rudy? Because he had known me since early childhood. It's the family doctor. Mm -hmm. He knew my whole health history. Every coughing, every earache, whatever. Rudy is in America. That's wonderful. What will, who is this? Thing? The doctor says, that's wonderful. Then she says, what will Rudy do? And my father with pride says, he will become a psychoanalyst. And the physician said, we we'll lift the Two, three minutes from Freud said, that's wonderful, would be a great success. All the psychoanalysis is always with <laughs> you. This is all in the same city, around a few yeah. blocks. Yeah. It's the, the way the world goes. And don't think for a moment that in New York, is any, even in Los Angeles, any different. <laughs> Ask the professors at UCLA and the behavior modifiers. Uh -huh. yeah. Such a close. So you have to live with this mixed feeling of admiration. I know something would become of you. Even when you were a little boy, I know you were a smart little boy. But what you're going to do? Just swim. Mm -hmm. Plenty now. You can find the types here. Maybe even in San Francisco. <laughs> Now, uh, you'd mentioned that uh, you considered Bernfeld one of your mentors. How was, what was the nature of your... I think the nature, you know, he became my mentor without I ever having a first... Mm -hmm. The book that did it was the Sisyphus. Mm -hmm. Because the Sisyphus says to be an educator is in this world entirely useless. Because the world, or the ones that run the universities and the high schools, don't let you get away with it. You cannot shape the children the way you want. You serve the, the organization. And the organization is hostile. The only time he could 
Sisyphus become a successful advocate? If the gods out there would not be the gods that Sisyphus had, but would be uh, socialist administrators. Mm -hmm. Little did he know what would happen in the Russia that at that time we all admired, mm -hmm. you know, after 1917. That it would become a rigid system, even more rigid than the system that we have in any of these capitalist countries at the same time. And he believed we must change the world and the part of it is you must understand yourself. And I was so impressed with the combination of sociology on the one hand and psychology on the other. So for me he was a kind of uh, modern Bible. You read that over and over again and then I met him. I really met him. First time I met him in Vienna, not him personally, but he was invited by Schlick to speak about the measuring of libido. And at that time it was for me, how could he believe? What does this mean to measure libido? What is libido? Can one measure it? Now, of course, as one American psychologist said, I forgot now whether it was Stevens, whoever it was, you can measure it only in more or less. Like you can say someone is more courageous than the other. But you cannot find a way of measuring your courage is 90% or 90 kilogram and mine is 15. It cannot be done. You can do more or less. And of course the argument at that time went that way and I found myself um, uh, struggling now Shall I go the linguistic way or the psychological way? And then I met him again. I met him a couple of times in America. And by that time he was an older man. He was after heart disease. Uh, he, had, he had by that time uh, given up much hope in psychoanalysis having a future. And the way I sensed it at the time, that he really seemed to say to me, do I, Siegfried Bernfeld, have a future? Mm -hmm. He had become a pessimistic man, although somebody who once in earlier days seemed to me a hero to follow, mm -hmm. you know, the one with whom you're willing to march wherever it goes. And at that time, he seemed to be a pessimistic man. I saw him once or twice, and I, of course, was very much occupied in with many of my writings with some of the thoughts of Bernfeld, particularly the ones on education. And uh, I came back to Vienna many, many years later, you know, in better days, and gave a paper about Bernfeld. I think I sent you some of the stuff that I did together with other people about the new Bernfeld. If not, we can look afterwards for okay. it. Yeah. And so in that sense, he became a hero to follow, and suddenly a hero where you figured maybe I have to go alone. Mm -hmm. And you come of course to a point in your life where if you want to do something yourself, you don't have to push away the heroes and argue against this and become an anti bernfeldian or an anti-Freudian. But you say on their, the heritage that they give me, I build on it and I try to help, help it to continue. Mm -hmm. And that's what is perfect to me today. Mm -hmm. So I would love, let's say, to have a seminar in San Francisco just on the Sisyphus. Mm -hmm. Wonderful seminar on the pros and cons. This leading in a world past and this showing how much of, of it is still applicable, but what would one have to change? When he then, as you know, in San Francisco, when he was there, he isolated himself more and more from the society for reasons that they did not want to accept at the time uh, his wife, since she was a lay analyst and there were difficulties, but the difficulties went farther because they thought it wasn't just because she was a lay analyst, uh, for them she was not competent enough, for Bernfeld it was just a lay issue, he withdrew and had then his own group. So in the end, he was an isolated man. 
except that it was in the mind of those of us who came from the past, deeply rooted. And for me, it's not isolated because it's in me. But if you think of the Sapling Society of that time, you know, and let's say if Winthold were alive and would tell you how he looked at it at the time, etc., it would be a different story. Mm -hmm. How so? It would be because at that time there was the medical issue mm -hmm. and the lay issue, and it is very hard to say to what degree did he defend the wife and to what degree did he defend a lay analyst. But these people at the time would believe he defended the lay analyst, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Rather than um, understanding him differently. And uh, it is also true that he became then in the end, both he and Suzanne, a man who left the original creative ideas of developing thoughts about education, for example, and they became historians and went back to Freud and wanted to describe the phases of Freud's life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, how shall I put it, if I have no place in the new world and be happy there, I now go to the old world. It would be as if you decide today chaos. I want to study philosophy of the seventeenth century. And you lose yourself in the past. And more and more get isolated. I saw him then once more when he was quite ill at the time. Uh, I think I, I was asked, you know, to see him only short because he wasn't well enough and uh, such an event. What what uh, anecdote do you recall, uh, or do you have any memory of him that sort of typifies? Hold on one second. I just change this. I wonder if you have any um, memories or anecdotes uh, that come to mind that would typify or illuminate Bernfeld's personality. I think one was the holding on to certain aspects of thinking, such as the insisting on measuring. Mm. You know, that is that you must quantify Psychoanalysis will never be a science unless it is quantifiable, which is, of course, one of the main objections to the very day. To make it accessible, acceptable to the rest of the psychological world, mm -hmm. can one measure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Whenever I think of that issue with him, I think of this famous word of the philosopher who says, the counting starts, understanding stops. Where counting starts, understanding stops. And I added that to it as would benefit, where there is understanding, counting should follow. You know, in other words, that we owe it to the world. It is not enough to live with more or less. In other words, we need scientific occupation, and even though some of the scientific activities to us analysts who are out in the practice seem sometimes naive, we need it, even though it is an immense struggle that we cannot live on more or less. Now, let's say when you take someone's temperature and you measure it, what is between 38 and 39 Celsius? What does it mean? How do we really know? When does it become dangerous? Can one then read into it what is the real illness? Because the illness is not temperature. Temperature shows of one of the less important symptoms. Yeah. Except sometimes that's all we do. Yeah. The first thing the mommy does when the kid comes home with the cheeks are take the thermometer, thermometer in your mouth. Then we have it. And then depending on the degree that you read there, you have more or less anxiety, you call up the doctor. Yeah. Does he know now what's wrong? And I think 
the struggle between the wish to become scientific, which of course he had from all universities, his university days, to the new thought. I must measure, I must measure. Yeah. But should I measure? For me, it was sort of one of these unbelievable experiences. I can still see him uh, in the Viennese seminar. You know, I know exactly in which street it took place in Liebigwasser, where the one was sitting and where the other was sitting. And to visualize that, that seemed to me. The other, of course, that I was deeply impressed with when I saw him again and saw the aged face and the illness and the tiredness. And it meant a lot to him, you know, I was at that time in Topeka and he, Bernfeld, also in the beginning once, was to, I think for a few days, or at least visited in Topeka, so he knew from where I was coming from, he knew what my education was. That was for him sort of some of the, one of the much younger people that came from the old world and utterly friendly, you know, I remember the whole session that I had with him, a sort of friendly gesture, you come from where I come from. But he didn't come exactly from where I come from, because originally he came from Poland. You know, he was born there. A Jew who moved west. Then he moved west. And then he moved north. And then from there he moved he moved west again. And then he moved to the States. Then he came to the Pico, south. Then he moved to San Francisco, up north. An eternal wonder. Mm -hmm. And I have a great deal of respect for that because sometimes my life seems to be that way. We wonder and wonder and wonder. Where are we finally settled? Then he's finally settled there. And he finds the analytic family and he don't see eye to eye. But a little bit of that was always in him. And all of us who were once revolutionaries, whether intellectual revolutionary or really politically engaged revolutionary, come constantly to situations where it has become a part of our character to not see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. You know, that is you. It's nice to be with you, but you know, I come from a different world and I do different things. You know, such as I showed you a little bit around here, and you cannot help but say, it's another world. And we live in another world because the world we once had we lost. And there's no way to get it back. Now, even if I come back now, you know, with all the things that you get, you know, get another honorary degree and you get another piece of metal or whatever it would be. Uh, it's not the same walk. Because when I walk there and saw so it is with Bernfeld, and any, either one of us would walk in Vienna, the same cobblestones. They feel the same. And you walk the streets. But what occurs to you is the thinking of old men. I remember he lived such and such. I remember here I saw Icon on the street. I remember here Anna Freud had dinner with us. It becomes more and more I remember, isn't it? And the last uh, Siegfried Bernfeld that I met was I remember. And so it was with many others. Let's say when I think of Winfolds, don't he, I found once a picture of Windholz when Freud visited Czechoslovakia, or Anna Freud visited Czechoslovakia. I think Anna Freud was the one who spoke in Freiburg. And there's the young Windholz. And I remember I found that picture and I sent him, and of course he was deeply moved. It goes back into the past. And of course, a little bit we want that when you meet all teachers, such as when you come and want to interview a man like me, you want to know about the past, but for slightly different reasons. Say, I can understand myself better today if I know the past. We do it a little sentimental that we exaggerate and say, you know, 
Weil er was für Freude in Vienna. Der fällt mir jetzt sehr. Der hat was für die Freude. Never again. In spite of all the things that were difficulties, namely that it meant to become a refugee, it meant to lose a home, it meant, it meant, it meant, it meant etc. Mm -hmm. You know, even with his love life, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I'm afraid I speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. What happened to the first wife? He was married. She goes east because she was communist. Goes to Russia where she disappears. Under Stalin, disappears. Isn't sure whatever happened to her. And he was west because that's where psychoanalysis permitted. But it is quite permitted the way he imagined and such went his life. Now when uh, were you from a, 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 were you associated with Suzanne Bernfeld also? I met Suzanne Bernfeld uh -huh. a few times and we spoke and exchanged writings, you know, some of the old writings of Bernfeld. I got through her, some of the things that I wrote I gave to her. Now um, you mentioned that uh, Windholz and Bernfeld would, would see the situation differently. I, you know, the, in, in San Francisco and, and that kind of I, I think in that sense, I will look here, I'm a lay analyst, never any difficulty with Windholz, but I was sort of an accepted piece from the old world, mm -hmm. you know. What he then tried to do was a little bit similar to what I successfully could do in many ways. I don't know whether I gave you the eulogy I wrote on Crow. I'll give you later. What I gave you, what I wrote there was that we came there and we could make Topeka into a place for lay analysts. We trained them. Some famous people now who are known, let's say like Herb, Herb Schlesinger or like Phil Holtzman who really made their, or Lester Laborski who made their place in the literature came all from there, Carl could permit it. But that was within an institution, and Carl, in a way, meant we should always be there, employed under the blessing guidance of medical people. That, however, in private practice, different story. Mm -hmm. As of what Carl Manninger would have done in private practice with his Jewish lay analysts from Europe, is a different question. And I think you have to see Windholz in the private practice of the San Francisco Cycling Society. Because with those like me that had found a place, or with the Bernfeld directly, he had no quarrels. He had quarrels with the politics. You know, I would imagine he would say, Rudy, that's right. And I would say, Vindy. But it, he did not do it within the organization. He did outside. Mm -hmm. And it became like in this town here, where I don't know how many cycling so organizations exist now. They fight each other or talk to each other or whatever it would be. We cannot separate the scientific endeavor of analysts from the political ways that they go. Mm -hmm. And you've got to see it this way. He holds a group together and there is someone, there's suddenly a competitive group. And San Francisco is a little smaller than Los Angeles, but that is much, much more difficult. And then you have also the usual difficulties, let's say, if you think of San Francisco and Berkeley, with the analysts in Berkeley, you know, whether you just go through the history of an Erickson, uh, the history of, of uh, the child analysts that worked in San Francisco, some of the people who were trained in Vienna, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine those were issues of the time, they always exist. The moment you have an institution come in a problem of what do I do now with power? Or above all, do I want power? Or so is it enough if I have teaching power? Mm -hmm. So I have made it for myself, as long as I could, a little more carefully. I teach in all organizations. I don't go on committees when I can avoid it. I'd be glad to be a consultant. 
I prepared the analyze to teach, etc., etc. And I think essentially that's what Benfred wanted too. Mm -hmm. But then when he had these young people around him that were interested, you know, like the man, the other that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it became instantly sort of an external threat. Just like if I had next door a kind of a society that claims that they do what I do. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood is I would leave them alone because I don't happen to be at the chairman of the education committee and I don't happen to be the president of the society. So do what you want, I do what I do. Mm -hmm. But you can't always do that. You know, let's say if you belong to an organization now, I don't know how old the organization is, but if it lasts a couple of years, political pressures develop. Mm -hmm. Politics cannot be twisted away. Well, how about the, the difference between the, the politics of, say, a San Francisco Institute, to LA, Topeka, versus the kind of institute you were, you were trained in, in Vienna? Uh, it existed there too. Oh. You know, it existed there too. There were a variety of people who, who uh, made it very difficult to accept lay people. In Vienna? In Vienna, and I saw even afterwards people in America, let's say, uh, like Helena Deutsch or others, who uh, strictly don't train my lay analysts. Don't train lay analysts. Mm -hmm. I mean, lay people, I mean. Isn't it? But, oh, but you said, look, why do you think Freud wrote the book on lay analysis? Mm -hmm. Go and read it carefully. But read it this time, not as a book by Freud, in an abstract sense, but read it as a political statement. Mm -hmm. And you write back in it, mm -hmm. what he defends. And with justification, you know, because if you think of some of the names, it wasn't only in defense of Anna Freud. You think of a Bertolt Bornstein, you think of a Siegfried Bernfeld, you think of an Anna Freud, you think of endless lay analysts of Chris, etc. were all non-medical and made marvelous contributions. And so a part of the struggle existed. You know, sort of a little bit like religious warfare, you know, when do the Protestants and the Catholics get together in one meeting? And they're against the Jews. Or when do or when do even within one church they can get along that you don't have any political struggles. Mm -hmm. Of course, we always say that if you're well analyzed, you shouldn't. But no one analyzes that good. You can't be that good. Now, how about uh, your affiliation with uh, uh, Eric Erickson and Anya Menchin, also San Francisco analysts? Anya Menchin and Erickson, of course, were, you know, from the European group. And therefore, our relationship always was become from Berkowski. Mm -hmm. with, with Ericsson, of course, more because this man wandered around. He was really a wanderer who wandered from place to place. <coughs> but with him, too. You know, I, I remember I, I once gave a talk and he discussed, and I discussed this picture and another one inside. This Picasso? Two Picassos, yeah. Uh -huh. And then he came and discussed. Mm -hmm. Just a lovely discussion. Uh, he has made a world for himself. And I think for me the answer for lay analysis is not to have a political struggle where you invest thousands of dollars in legal fights. Let him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't stop him. They have not asked me for advice, so I don't give them advice. I do believe, even today, not only at the time when I came, when you prove your value, it may perhaps take 10 years longer that you become a part of it, but you become. Mm -hmm. I would have no difficulty in any analytical group today if I knocked at their door and said, well, come and join. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would, no, but I wouldn't knock. I wouldn't know ahead of time. That you know that they want to know. Mm -hmm. And Erickson was such a person. Mm -hmm. Now, was yeah. he in the seminars that you were in uh, in 1935? No. 
So by that time, I believe he was gone. Oh yes. Yeah, he was gone. He left much earlier. But Anna Menchen, she was. Anna Menchen was still there. Anna Menchen was still one of my tutors. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now she's now an elderly lady. Oh, well, now she she died last day. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot almost. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, sort of hard to think. That's of course when we all get older, you know, eulogy after eulogy. Yeah. Of course, she had it difficult too, because she didn't grow up, at least I grew up in a nice district. I was right nearby. She came from somewhere. She was a refugee even then. Mm -hmm. She's not a Viennese. Oh, oh yes, she's from uh, Russia. Yeah, you know, if you understand, you know. She started that much earlier than I to run from place to place. Uh -huh. And those of us who had such experiences, we have learned to fight, but to wait long enough to know when do you start to fight. Mm -hmm. you know, I have no opposition to fighting, you know. <laughs> but if I've got to kick you in the face, I want to know that my fist is strong at the moment. <laughs> Every Jew has learned it. <laughs> you know, they're not cowards, they just figure out so did Freud. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you say uh, Anna Menchen was your tutor? In, no, not the tutor. She ran a seminar at Vienna. Sem uh -huh. And I was one of the people. Who was this? What kind of seminar? Well, Sacred pedagogy, whatever. I uh -huh. forgot now what the title was. Mm -hmm. So were you being trained in child analysis? I was trained at that time in Vienna, uh -huh. primarily in psychoanalytic pedagogy, but the way that was taught there, uh, the way I was supervised by different people, such as by Willy Hofer or August mm -hmm. I realized compared to what we do in America, the Americans would have all called their child psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's every good teacher is also a little bit of a therapist, mm -hmm. if he knows what he's doing. So were you, so you were would you see children individually, or were you going into the school? I would go into the homes in Vienna uh -huh. and work with children, or they would come to my home, you know, in the apartment. It was not yet a private practice. And I had in Vienna a, 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 a Viennese analyst supervising it. Uh -huh. Who is you your know, like Edith Buxbaum and like Willy Hofer. I see. And so you would go and present your cases? And, and would bring the case and, and they would help me slowly, just like people do now. Mm -hmm. And was it a, a play therapy with toys or...? Any. Any. You know, I would, I would have uh, uh, situations where I would walk around with a boy in a park. Uh -huh. And that was the therapy. Uh -huh. Or I would crawl with him under the bed of his parents because he didn't want to study, so I said, that's great, I don't want to teach you either, let's spend the time under the bed. <laughs> and he screamed, I want to study. I said, okay, let's go study. He opens the window and says, I'm going to throw myself it out of the window. Please, throw yourself out of the window. You would let me kill myself? No, if, it, if you think it's more important to be killed than to study, okay, let's study. <laughs> to tell anecdotes about the way it went, you know. <laughs> and he took a supervisor, you know, because yeah. to be to be able to do that, you know, rather than do what his father would have done, namely to kick his teeth out. Uh -huh. You know, was an angry father against whom he constantly rebelled. Uh -huh. So then he rebelled against me. He's a successful old man now in England. Uh -huh. We follow some of those. You do? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, strangely enough, through the sister. The sister, sister escaped to Australia. You know, when you sometimes think of what happened to all of us, where all of us are, it's just beyond belief. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I have schoolmates. One escaped to Holland, he perished with the Dutch Air Force. One is alive, he's in Australia. Another one is dead, he went to Jerusalem. All schoolmates. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one, is in New Zealand, another one is in, in the States, and such a course. 
Did you know um, Elsa Franco Brunswick or Egon Brunswick? Yes. Yeah. Did you know them in Vienna? In Vienna, because they were my teachers, they were assistants to Bühler. Ah. You know, except what they also did, particularly she, they became secretly also into, like me, had analytic training. So they were with Bühler, which was Bühler's philosophy, and in part they also played with other ideas. It's a small world. So it, but it was, it wasn't okay to do those two that you say they had to do. Uh, it was, it, 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 the way I got my doctor's degree was that I was asked at the last examination by Bühler, what are our objections to psychoanalysis? So I, I told him all the objections that he wrote down in his main book, the crisis of psychology, the crisis of philosophy of psychology. And he said that those are still the best objections. And so identifying with the teacher, that was the only the difference between that schlick who says have thoughts of your own. Uh -huh. And the other one who says, What are my thoughts? This is Bueller? That was Bueller. Uh -huh. And they became good friends. And I told him the story of his 80th birthday and told him how I became a doctor of philosophy under him. <laughs> But no, it was easy. <laughs> he didn't take your doctorate away. No, he didn't take it away and laughed and laughed and laughed and become a kind of man. Aging helps. Uh, <laughs> the anger goes with some of us. <laughs> now how about, uh, uh, what, what sort of thoughts might you have about uh, the Americanization of psychoanalysis? Well, we know what we usually do. You know, the fear that it will become superficial. And, you know, whenever a science is not for a selected group of people, let's say the well-to-do upper middle class in Vienna that goes into this analysis, but it is used for many people. You know, you put it into social work, you put it into psychologists, you put it everywhere, and you make it available for more and more people. You become automatically superficial because you must find ways to do with a few hours enough to help a person to make a few steps. And the danger is if you don't maintain the core. Although I would, let's say, you look at my practice now, I have a number of people in analysis, much less than in the beginning, because good many cases come for supervision, good many cases come for consultation good many cases have just psychotherapy, mm -hmm. isn't it? So I became in a way Americanized, but the needs are different. Well, in those early days, there were 70 analysts. Now, how could they touch two million people? You know, it could only touch it if you also do work. That was, for example, a little bit like Icon, who sometimes saw someone two or three times. There were beginnings of that. Mm -hmm. But most of the people at that time use straight psychoanalysis. What all of us do now, we do sometimes work that's diluted. You know, let's say if I would go through with you my book to tell you what I do with different people, you would find, compared to what I, for example, did at Benningers, because I was their training analyst, they needed me the whole time. It has become thinner. I do if you like to Americanize things. You know, but that happens with everything, you know. You know, when you come to Vienna now, you can go and find there, uh, now what is this eating place? McDonald's hamburgers. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine you go to a Viennese restaurant, you eat McDonald's hamburgers? It's become Americanized. Mm -hmm. you know? It's eatable food, you know. You, I eat it, but it's no Saha Hotel, or it's not even a little Viennese restaurant where you eat non-Americanized food. So we have given the world a lot of good things, and some of them are superficial, you know, just like our movie industry. You know, the old Malene Dietrich, like uh, the Blue Angel, if you ever saw it. It doesn't compare to the stuff that I turn on on television. 
although occasionally even the Americans have magnificent books. But we also have a lot of Americanization. How many people can have a, a home like this? This home isn't Americanized, so you can live here like a good old Freudian. Or you can say, well, I want to make a living and do a little behavior modification. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours. You, know? yeah. you can go and go to the opera. You know, when you're satisfied, like tonight, I will go now to uh, to uh, the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. It would be very pleasant. But to think of Viennese opera and have fireworks going to Tchaikovsky music. But then I was the other day for a vacation away for a few days in, uh, no, in, uh, I forgot now the name of the place is called. Out in the desert, and we saw a magnificent opera. You can have in America a magnificent opera, and you can have the usual stuff that you turn on when you have television. It's mm -hmm. for all, and nobody is forbidden to do the one or the other. So even the Viennese have now my found hundreds. And I once went to Hawaii, you know, with all my fantasy about Hawaii. Hawaiian women and the ocean, whatever, you know. We went eating to make the whole time work. You can't get away from it. You know, in Russia, they have that too? No. <laughs> <laughs> and in China? Yeah. Where is good old Lenny? <laughs> now, how about uh, in, in terms of. Uh, the difference between, say, classical uh, analysis, uh, drive theory, and uh, American or innovations that were developed in American I, I, ego psychology. I tell you, I tell you, when Anna Freud was in Manningus, mm -hmm. I remember to the day when she spoke. She said, I love this place because you have a core of straight classical analysis and you teach all your people also endless variations like short therapy, like social work, like case work, like group psychotherapy, etc. Mm -hmm. We need it all, but we must defend a core. Not in that sense that we want the core to win over and only analysis, but in the sense that there should some be a core where there is enough scientific push that gets it forward and doesn't give it up, and then there should be all applications. The, but that was even true in Vienna, because certainly pedagogy was certainly a, a, a variation of child analysis. It was not child analysis, right. isn't it? And so I would be, if, if, if I would be in a power play, I want a core of sound analytic training I wouldn't look down on people who also want to run a clinic, you know, or, or have a, a, a good many patients that either cannot do more or are not suitable for something else. They need something else and give them what they need. Mm -hmm. You know, so that uh, if you if you think that you are a good doctor, you ask yourself what does my patient need? But you want to have a core of people who have a university deeply involved in research and deeply involved in maintaining a core. But not to wipe out the rest. But also not to be wiped out by the rest. And that's what I like to see in the States. And elsewhere. Obviously it's true in Vienna too. Don't believe for a moment all they do is classical analysis. Let's check this out. Talked uh, 
talked quite a bit about uh, the past. What about, uh, what sort of visions do you have of the future? What's to come? What would you like to see? I, I would like to see an endless, never-ending struggle between tradition and renewal. I want to be enough people for whom it's important to salvage a few pieces of art or whatever it is of the past and defend the idea one should go back to the original work of Freud mm -hmm. and at the same time enough Sturm und Drang struggle, we need new things. But that is exactly what Freud taught us, isn't it? Tradition and renewal. That he never gave up his old teachers. He didn't condemn Breuer. He didn't condemn his French teachers. He stuck with it. But he renewed. Mm -hmm. And he asked the same of us. And I would like a, how shall I put it, an institute where one is glad there are a few of the older people there, even if they are sometimes a little strong about defending the past. Mm -hmm. You know, constantly going to go back to to Ferenc and to Fenicli, etc. Should go back to it. But at the same time, allow there is a little bit more, you know, maybe that the world should move. And I think every good university has that. Mm -hmm. And you want students who take to the old man and sometimes like to demonstrate against them. You know? Mm -hmm. I want to have a lively classroom. I have few classrooms. You should just see what goes on sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sh sheer pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets a little hectic, we interrupt and I have coffee and cake for them all the time and then we recover. And then they ask, can I borrow a book? And I know in spite of the oppositional comments that he made earlier from the book that he wanted to borrow for a week or two, <laughs> that, are, that I am the one going to win, <laughs> isn't it? But I can only win if I let him be himself. You know, it's sort of a struggle that I could put it up as a good way for us to slowly come to a close. It's a struggle of mutual identification. Namely, I got to know you for the first time, you didn't be, meet before, except the letters respectively the telephone conversation, and I say he would have picked something up from the past. He won't throw it away, but could ask it. Yeah, but, but he would revise it. I mean, if he would ever write about it, he would edit it. There are a few such people who do that with me. Then he will ask me, could I write it this way? And then I will try to correct it. And after a while, I have learned something about the new world and he about the old world. But then I came to America. You know, I was the other day, uh, as I told you, in, uh, on that trip. And I don't know, I, maybe I can show you a few uh, posters that I brought along that I would like to find a place with. And in the morning, we went, my wife and I, and the daughter was on that trip with us to the uh, cliff dwellings of the Indians there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Santa Fe I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Cliff dwellings. I saw how people lived. And they still live there. And then we went back to Santa Fe, and there is an open opera, you know, you have the sky over you, if it rains you need an umbrella. A magnificent Monserro. In one day we went from the Indians at the cliff dwellings to the Mozart opera. Well, the Mozart opera isn't the newest either because it's 200 years that he's dead. But compared to the cliff dwellings, he was sort of a thousand years ahead. And what comes after Mozart? There comes now some music that I would like to comprehend, I don't always comprehend. You know, it's, for me, this is not my music. But I try, I have a son who plays such music. You know, with his instruments, he has a, a bluegrass. Uh -huh. you know, can you imagine that this must be about your age? Mm -hmm. And he tries to sell bluegrass to his Mozart daddy. <laughs> you know, 
And I think that's the way I look about psychoanalysis, that there should always be enough who are not afraid to go back into the past and who at the same time can play with the new. That it is sort of back and forth. And that's what analysis is all about. What do you dream about? Do you dream about the future or the past? You know, when a dream of yours gets analyzed. Mm -hmm. It always goes back and forth. You know? It's sort of a little bit like like I took my wife this year to a gravestone in Vienna, in near Vienna, you know, about 50 miles out of Vienna. It's a big gravestone. The gravestone is of my grandparents. And when my father and uncle died, I added to the gravestone since they died under completely different conditions. My father in America, the uncle died under dreadful conditions in Austria. But their names, you know. And the gravestone is there, and then you read the years, they, they died shortly after I was born. I never knew them, or maybe before, I can't even remember the year now. I just have over there the gravestone, the, the photograph. And they represent a family that lived under the Kaiser. Yeah? And there's a wall, and behind the wall, is a mass grave. When the Nazi, when the Americans came, and the Nazis says to withdraw from that town, they caught all the Jews that were still alive and killed them and threw them into the mass grave. So between, be, 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 between the ordinary life of the people who lived under the emperor, is still alive for those who did not survive under the Nazis. And then you have survivors go there and look at it. Tradition, destruction, survival, renewal. That's the way it goes with analysis. You know, uh, the work of Freud, respectively, the work of all these people who are represented here, you can't wipe out, even if somebody came and burned all these books. So I'm going to travel around in Europe and try to find every book and a copy of it. And that's what people like us do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have to do otherwise, if you're rather go to the lousy movies in Los Angeles, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> so all this is now on that. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Make yourself known again. And if uh, will you try sometimes to write these things? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. And you're going to keep me in mind. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's one thing I promised. You. I thought I should give you. Do you remember what? You mentioned the uh, article about. Uh, you mentioned a couple of articles. Yeah. Uh, one with you and uh, Bruno Bettelheim. And. Uh, Let's quickly out it and show you what I've got. Okay. Turn it off. Right. Goodbye. <laughs> Tell him to be nice to me when he works on it.